Hey, I'm Amy, and this is the Half Calf Podcast, where we talk about knitting and crochet, and I definitely have both to talk about today. Uh, I think this is episode 14, and I wanted to record this earlier as usual, um, but I've been waiting for a sunny, quiet morning, and we're just not getting a lot of those here in the Pacific Northwest. It's pretty typical here in spring where you will have rain and sunshine and clouds and wind um, in like rotation every day. Like I, we will get rain three times a day and sun breaks and it just kind of goes like that. So um, it's not super consistent in spring, which I already knew, but um, I'm kind of recording indoors. So I'm hoping that maybe next episode, I'll be able to come to you from my backyard in a quiet morning if I can get up at 6am on a Sunday. So here I am in my office again, um, with all the books in the backdrop, and hopefully it's not too busy, but hey, we'll make do. Um, Today's mug is not a mug. It's just my water bottle um, because I've already had coffee today and I don't need any more. I'm not out of mugs yet. Um, I've got more to show you, but yeah, today it's just water. So I hope you're doing well wherever you are in the world. I know some parts of the world are doing better than others, um, but we're here to talk about knitting and crochet and hopefully lift our spirits a little bit. So I'm going to make every effort to do that. So the first thing I want to start with is what's behind me. Um, this is the Bracklin Crop by Little Theorem. I think she might be Little Theorem Knits. Um, this is a test knit I did a couple of years ago now. Um, I originally did it in this gorgeous, gorgeous red, um, and I ended up making that for my daughter. I just felt like casting on another one and I had this incredible kit. So this kit is by Fall for November Yarns um, and it is a, the, the kit is called Coastal and I bought um, a regular size kit, which I'll show you. Sorry if the crinkles bother you. And uh, a mini set. Well, this is a mini set, but a mini mini set. <laughs> So I bought two. Um, I, these are, these colors I just adore. Um, the, the blues and the browns, like they are my half calf crochet colors, like the business colors. I just love it. So when I saw this, this fade kit, I knew I had to get it. And so I got a couple of them, um, mostly because I wanted to make sure I had a sweaters quantity or a, you know, a, a garment quantity in, um, a garment that I need to for my size. So I was kind of just trying to estimate what that would be. So I ended up getting, uh, a kit of, I think it's 10. Yeah. 10. This is a, a set of 10 fade and, um, they're 20 gram mini skeins, but then I got a mini, mini kit, which is, um, 10 skeins of 10 gram minis. Um, and I did that to make, cause I, cause like two, I didn't need quite enough of, but so I kind of wanted to make sure I could supplement the yarn. Anyway, I messed that all up because I just decided I wanted to use the mini, mini kit <laughs> for this one. Um, because this doesn't take a lot of yarn. It depends on what size you're making, but I mean, it's short sleeve. Um, it's meant to be cropped. I think I made it a little bit longer than the pattern calls for, but um, you know, it's supposed to be kind of just short and, and easy. So I figured I could use that kit um, and that I'd still have enough to do something um, with the remaining kit. Sorry for the crinkles. Here's what I, here's the kit. Um, I'll show you the back so you can see all the colors. So I just, this kit is just perfect. It is, a it, it's on her timeless sock base, um, which is a fingering four ply, superwash merino, nylon, the standard. Um, the only thing that's missing from this kit that you will see in here is, um, it's a different yarn. It's one I substituted because I didn't have quite enough. I knew I would need, um, you know, one, one more, maybe two more skeins given the yardage I needed for the size I was making, which I'll get to. So this, uh, this section right here with the speckles in it is actually not from the kit at all. And I think, I think it goes pretty well. I mean, I'm, I like it more than I don't like it. Um, I love the yarn, of course. This one I've had for a while. This was a skein of, um, uh, sapling sock from Cedar House Yarns, and it is in the colorway Our Neighbors to the North. And this was one I just kind of had to get because it was so, it was the, it was the blue and brown, right? I, again, I love those colors. Um, 
To be honest, I'm not usually a fan of speckled yarns. Like they're so pretty, but like using them, I just don't find that I want to use them in my work. Um, so I don't usually get that kind of thing, but I did decide to this time again because of the colors and I just, I went for it. So I decided to sub with this because I thought that, you know, it would be okay. And then the, it picks up the browns and the, the blues. And since it's a blue fade, I figured I would kind of just try to jam it in somewhere and hopefully it would work. It's a little grayer than the other blues, but I, I feel like that's okay. Um, however, if I'd gone, so obviously I started at the blue end and I was going to go to the brown end, right? And so this, um, I don't know if you can see that, yeah, the, the lightest color of brown would have been at the, um, center and then the bottom, the, the darkest color of brown would have been at the bottom. However, when I was doing this, um, I thought, you know, to go back to this like light color uh, after this, I'm afraid that's just going to make this look like kind of even grayer and dirtier. Um, so what I decided to do then, and and again, I think it more worked than not, although, you know, there's, there's room for discussion. Um, I decided to go right into the browns and just kind of mix it up and then go um, lighter again and then use the rest of the blue in here and on the sleeve cuffs. Um, I played yarn chicken with this, especially with the body, and I had like this much yarn left. I mean, it was an epic win. Um, so I don't have anything left except, of course, the neighbors to the north because that was not part of the kit. And so that was actually a whole 100 gram skein. So I still have plenty of that. And I can use it in the other kit if I decide to, whatever I decide to make with that. Anyway, so um, this is a top down, um, you know, split for the sleeves, go straight down. There's no shaping, um, pretty casual to, to make and to wear. I made the um, 36 to 38 bust uh, simply because I, th this was intended to sell. Um, I knew that I wouldn't have enough yarn to make one for myself. This is a great pattern really nice to do. The lace breaks it up. The lace and the color changes. This is made for, this is like made to use with minis, like 20 gram midi, minis. Um, so you can, you'll have like five colors and she kind of helps you figure out like if you want to use more colors, you know, here's how to kind of plan the, plan these breaks. Um, these were not planned because I had to just go, you know, I had to do whatever yarn I had. So, um, I hoped it would kind of work out and it kind of did see like the break, like the yarn break happens right in the center of the um, lace sections for the most part. Like it doesn't here. Um, this is a little bit wider uh, that because the breaks are kind of like this. This is three colors up here. And then of course the, the banding down here. So I don't know if like, especially the banding down here kind of cuts into it too much. Sometimes I think it does, but that's what happens with the fade tangent. I was wondering, I didn't try it in here because I was halfway through before I even got the idea, but I was kind of wondering if, does it work to make a fade more gentle if you do um, like a row or two of like staggered stitches? Like something like, I, I kind of wonder if it might like, and maybe I'm wrong, but um, you know, if I, if I had, when I was splitting or when I was changing from this blue to this blue, say this aqua to this, this aqua, <laughs> um, if I didn't just like break right into the next yarn, but I kind of did a row of, or two or so of every other um, stitch being one of the each, each color so that it kind of fades better. Has anyone done this? I might try it sometime and see how it looks you know, and if it doesn't work, maybe it's just a design feature if I'm consistent, so it'll be fine. <laughs> but I'm curious at trying that. Anyway, I didn't do that. And um I wasn't sure how long these would end up being. So planning it would have been difficult because I didn't have, an, I didn't have enough yarn to mess with, you know. Anyway, so I'm not sure if this banding is a little too stark, um, but hopefully it's okay. And the, um these lace breaks, I think, I think they worked out all right where they ended up just landing. Um, I was mindful that I didn't start a new color in the middle of the row for the most part. There's a couple times that happens, but I kind of did the little trick to make sure that you don't have a jog in your color. Um, so hopefully that helped. But for the most part, I just tried to um, start the new color, at least at the seam, um, if I knew I wasn't going to make it all the way around. And I usually only had like you know, this much yarn left over from each color. So again, it was very efficient and I loved that. Used everything from the kit. Um, anyway, I made the size 36 to 38 and this is, this ended up being a 34 and this is after it's blocked. So I didn't check my gauge, um, 
I figured it would be fine. And so maybe I didn't get gauge. Uh, I'm again, I'm not, if I were trying to make sure this would fit me, I might've been more concerned about gauge and measuring earlier on and that kind of thing. Um, but for me, as long as it's proportional, I kind of just make whatever size it works out, assuming it's not like wildly nuts. It's good enough. So I'm just surprised that this ended up being um, smaller, uh, but it's fine. Because again, I'm just selling it. I'm not trying to cater to it fitting somewhere, someone in particular. So that's the Bracklin crop. Love it. Possibly put it on my Etsy shop or just save it for the, the fairs this summer. Um, this is, uh, this is Chloe. She, Chloe is modeling this. Chloe likes to collect a lot of <laughs> random stuff here. So she's getting, she's very decorated. Anyway, uh, what's next? Let me get to the next project. So I decided to do, um, I had the yarn for it already, um, and I've just been meaning to get back to it. So I decided to do another Mandala Madness parasol. It's not a parasol, it's a blanket. Um, but you know, you can do whatever you want with it. And I made it a parasol. So, um, I did one of these last year, last summer. Um, and it's in a, uh, it's in cotton yarn. Um, and it fades from like this super gorgeous, like rosy pink to a black. Um, so I got two skeins of those and I ended up using one and just a little bit to get around to a, to the, the last row to get the, the black around to the next row before I could stop. Um, so I, this is, I basically used, um, almost all of a skein for this one. So I wouldn't have to borrow for, from another skein. So I've got a little bit left. And honestly, it's hanging on the end here because I wasn't sure if I was going to try to make it longer. So, or, you know, bigger. The reason for that is that, um, for, to make a parasol, of course, you have to find a frame, an umbrella frame. And I didn't know what size I was going to get you. I try to get child size because that way, um, you know, it's kind of just like a little dainty parasol instead of like this huge rain umbrella. You don't really want that. Um, that's, that's a little much for a parasol. Um, but you don't know exactly what you're going to get. Um, especially because I try to find them at like thrift stores and stuff and then repurpose them. So I thought, you know, if I need a, a little bit more room, I want to make sure I haven't cut the yarn off. I mean, again, I can, I can go back. It's fine to add yarn, but so I've still got this little bit left. Um, I finally did find a parasol or a, an umbrella frame to fit. I haven't fitted it yet, but it will fit. So I'm going to, I'll cut this off and hide the tail and stuff, and then we'll be all ready. So let me show it to you. It's quite big. Um, this is Mandala Madness by Helen Shrimpton. And I used uh, Cotton King's Let's see, it's Cotton King's Shadow, I think. Here, let me show you the skein. This is what it looks like in the skein, which is really cool. Um, so I used, it's 100% cotton, uh, Cotton King's Twirls Shadow. This is a 200 gram um, cake. So this Mandala Madness, again, is the pattern name. Um, I did to row, I think about 54. Um, you don't need to look at me. This is, you can just look at this. I did to about row 54. Um, and that I think fits like a 34, 32, 34 inch parasol. This is already blocked. Um, and I give it a pretty good stretch as much as I can to get the, um, lace to open up. And, um, uh, then I will stretch it again when I hang it, um, on the parasol and tack it to all of the ends. So, um, the one thing I keep, okay, a couple tips if you want to ever do this. Um, you could make a magic circle. There's my finger. That's what I do. This is crochet, by the way. <laughs> um, and there's my little tail. You could make a magic circle <clears throat> in crochet. And then the, the theory is um, you can leave it open, you know, a little bit like I did. I did. And you should leave it like even more open. Um, and then you can pull it tight around the, um, stem, uh, the little tip post, whatever on top of the parasol, um, in order to, uh, you know, secure it. So you need it to be big enough so that you can put it through that stem and then you put whatever cap is on, on top. Um, 
<laughs> of the parasol to of the frame. However, this is often not big enough. Um, it is big enough to fit around the little um, the little metal stem, but there's usually a cap on there and it's usually very difficult to get off. It's not meant to come off. It's usually glued depending on what um, you find. If you're shopping around in thrift stores for kid umbrellas, you know, trust me, you're, it's going to be glued. <laughs> um, so sometimes I try to get it around that, but there's no way. This is not actually very flexible once you get the whole piece made as much as it seems so. You can, you definitely can't make it larger. You can only make it smaller. And as you're working, um, you know, into these, into this, you know, it kind of, it just wants to get smaller. Um, so I've got enough room for a post to go there, but no, you know, definitely no room to get it over whatever cap is on top of that, that post at the very top of the parasol. However, my clever, clever husband, um, was able to use a heat gun and melt the glue that's holding the cap onto all my parasols that I've got laying around that have of varying sizes to use because I'll make more of these. Um, and I was afraid he was going to melt the plastic, right? Uh, but he didn't. He was just able to melt the glue and the plastic was intact. So he was able to get the plastic cap off of all the umbrellas. So now this hole will be big enough. I won't have to, I don't know, cut the center and, you know, risk everything unraveling and just be in terror the whole time. Uh, no sticking my cotton crochet, please. <laughs> um, so that's what I recommend. Two things. Um, one, keep in mind that you're going to have to put this over a post or something. So you want the center to be a little bit more open. If you're afraid of a magic, like again, I would do the magic circle to be flexible, but it turns out it just doesn't really end up that flexible. Um, so I might be able to put the post here and then pull a little bit in order to close it around the post. That might be okay. But if you've got some cap that you can't get off of your parasol, you know, if you have to get it over, like you don't have a heat gun because hello, you know, it's not a common household item. <laughs> um, you might have to account for it going over your, your, your cap um, because you won't be able to take it off and then somehow like cinch it in and secure it in after the fact, like by sewing it on or something. So consider having to have that hole big enough to fit over the cap if you're going to do that. That's my advice to you. None of this is mentioned in the, pat uh, the pattern, of course, because this is just, you know, a mandala or a blanket or whatever you want it to be. So it's not, I'm using it for parasol purposes. Um, and so those are kind of like special considerations that, you know, the pattern would never have to worry about. So I love it. Um, it's beautiful. I love the fade to black. Um, I have one more cake of this purple and one more cake of the rosy pink. So I plan on using those in the future for other parasols. And then I'd like to get other colors. I just didn't want to get, you know, just go nuts and buy all the colors because, you know, this takes a long time. And to be honest, if you get this pattern, this is a free pattern. Um, and what's really nice about this pattern is that uh, she has, uh, someone has created a video for it. And there are, like I said, I went to row 54 and I don't even think I'm halfway there. I have no idea um, for the, the, you know, entire blanket. Uh, I think that's all I have to say about that. What next? Um, I've still got finished objects. Okay. So let's get into, um, a f okay. So yeah, let's get into this finished object. Okay. So I'm sure you've had it happen where you just get bitten by some bug for some pattern or for some kind of yarn or for some, some stitch pattern or something. And you just get like so crazy excited and you want to knit all the things in that thing, right? That's what happened to me. Um, super weirdly, <laughs> it happened not only with cotton, but like the, 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 the cheapy workhorse kind of rough and ready, sturdy, uh, cotton that is, um, I think it's Lily Sugar and Cream, right? I mean, you can find this at like Michael's, Joann's, whatever, um, you know, your, your basic like box craft store type of thing, right? This is very commercial yarn. Um, it's totally good for like washcloths and, you know, stuff like that. And I've worked with it here and there, um, but I'm not really like a washcloth dish towel kind of knitter. I just don't get into those projects. So, um, and I hardly ever work with cotton, actually, to be honest, I've worked with it. Like, you know, I can count on one hand, the times I've worked with it, that, that mandala madness, um, being like two of those times. So 
I don't work with cotton very often in any size or gauge or whatever, but I just somehow I must have been browsing um, and seen some picture or something, but I suddenly thought I want to make a bag like a cool like rainbow 70s vibe with fringe kind of bag in that like kind of like rough and ready cotton. <laughs> like why? I don't know, but I, this bug bit me hard. So I made four of them. <laughs> um, and then I kind of had the bag bug. And again, I'm thinking about fairs that I want to sell stuff at this summer and I'm not going to be selling like, you know, turtlenecks and sweaters and stuff. So I'm like, yeah, bags, right? That's great. So every once in a while, I like to do a bag. Um, I've done a number of them, but, the, you know, kind of never like crammed them all uh, in a row as much as I have here. So I'm going to show you the finished ones. And um, at one point, we'll transition into um, the whips. And I've got two more that are whips. So let me show you the finished ones first. This These were not my original idea, um, but these were ones that I decided to, to make um, after the original idea. The original idea is a different shape. Um, so these are just super simple kind of bags. There it is. It is a rectangular shape, squarish. It's technically a rectangle. This is with C2C. So corner to corner crochet. The other ones I didn't do that way. Um, I just made a big old circle. So I'll show you that. The thing about these bags is I knew they had to have, I wanted to have zippers and linings and stuff like that. Now I'm I'm not great at that kind of thing because the mental gymnastics you have to do to think about, okay, this is the inside, but you got to fold the seam, in, the seam in this way. So you got to sew on this side, but this is the right side of the fabric. Like it's not just right sides together. Like, especially when you're thinking about a zipper for a bag and how you want it to end up and how you want the inside to be showing. It's just, it kind of, my brain just does not do that. So I, any kind of spatial, anything, any kind of like stuff like that, I have to learn every time. It just does not stay. Trust me, <laughs> even with practice. Um, so I watched a ton of tutorials kind of to learn, uh, relearn and kind of to, uh, like for moral support, <laughs> frankly, but, um, I was able to do it. Uh, and this is, I don't know. A lot of this is hacked and you can't really tell. So that's great. I, you know, I feel like it's not like super clean, but I was able to do it. Yeah, you can kind of see like, you can see some of my stitches, whatever. It's fine. It's fine. Um, so, but I decided to do a, a colored zipper because I just saw a couple and they were cute. So this does unzip. Wee! And the good thing about this is that I just decided to do canvas and I didn't do a pocket. I'm just keeping it simple. A pocket would be cool, but I just, I couldn't be arsed, especially because I was making a bunch of these and it just, it's really hard. So the good thing about canvas, I, the canvas just like, okay, it's not canvas in the sense that it's that thick. It's not that heavy. Um, but you know, that kind of canvasy, like neutral buff kind of color, um, for fabric. And the reason I decided to do that is, um, because this, I don't know, I just feel like it fit, fit with the vibe better, um, with this kind of like, I don't know, neutral granola, rainbow 70s kind of vibe. I don't know what I'm thinking. Anyway, um, so where was I? So I decided to do it because of that. However, the bonus that I didn't even think about until I got to it, which was like super awesome, is there's no wrong side. So I had less to less of a learning curve to worry about like, am I gonna like have this inside out, right? Have the lining inside out meaning that you want the right side side pointed in because that's what you're going to see when you open the zipper. <laughs> oh, brain. So there's one. And I just did a really simple, um, you know, crocheted. This is like double crochet, like two rows of double crochet. Basically I did use a foundational, um, a foundation chain. If you don't know what that is, um, I will try to link my video on it because I did, that's the one tutorial I've had on my channel. I meant to do more. I just, you know, doing it hasn't happened, but that's the one tutorial I have done on my cha channel is what a foundational crochet chain is. So I did that. It gives it, um, a more of a balanced stretch. Um, because in crochet, of course, you crochet usually into chains. Um, rather than you set all your, you know, you cast on, like there's no real cast on and crochet, uh, type of thing. But if you do this, the foundational chain, um, it's kind of the cast on thinking, but it's not really a cast on anyway. 
Let's keep going. So this is the second one I made with fringe. Let's just fix that. There you go. And I randomly decided to make a stripe in the um, handle, which matches the zipper, which is yellow. So, ta-da! I feel like my linings are pretty good, except that I didn't sew them as cleanly as I'd like, and they um, they have a wrinkle on them that bugs me, but I don't think that, I think I just noticed that. I think that's just me, right? So there's another one, same deal, C2C, C2C crochet, which means you crochet all these little squares as you go. It's a certain technique. Some of you may know it. Okay, so... Um, let's see. I'm going to show you now the whips, okay, that have to do with that. So, these are the whips. This is the one I did. Yeah, this is the one I first did. So, this was my idea. So, the crocheting is done, but this is not attached, right? The lining is not attached. <laughs> um, but the zipper is attached to the lining and it's kind of fitted in. I just need to like pin it. But the reason I haven't done that yet is because I'm trying to decide how I'm going to do the straps. And um, I think the straps are going to come like right out of here and just like go straight up and then, you know, be around and come straight down. I'm trying to just make sure that they're stable um, and that they're comfortable to wear. So I'm still braining that, which is why I haven't sewed the lining in because sometimes you want to like attach the straps inside and you can't do that if you've sewn the lining. So um, this one is really just boop, a whole circle. It's kind of pinned so you can't see that. Let me show you the other one. The other one is a little bit taller. So I made it an oval so that the rainbow would be taller. Oh, that one's not, that one's pinned too. You can see how I've kind of like tried to see this is where it's going to be. But anyway, it's just a big circle. This isn't, a, this wasn't an, an oval, not a circle. Um, and then I did on this one, I just randomly, I think it was just this one. Yeah, I just randomly decided to do, is it the crab stitch? Um, which in crochet um, is basically like you, it's reverse. So you go in the reverse direction and it's just, it's kind of nice show you kind of makes a nice and kind of sturdy edging so that's nice anyway this just feels kind of this feels like smooth and rough at the same time like it's sturdy and kind of just like I love it I love this this is just exactly the vibe I was going for so I bought a ton of cotton and have been going crazy <laughs> with that Okay, I'm going to show you a couple more works in progress. We're going to jump to the works in progress because my last finished object is going to be a whole thing. Um, so I'm going to actually save that for last in part because um, it's the coolest, <laughs> right? And in part because I'm going to give you a lot of tips if you want to do this project that I've acquired and written down for myself and all that. So that's why it's going to be at the end, just because. Okay. So this is made out of the same Lillian cream cotton, um, but these are in, isn't that cute? Oh my God, I love that. Um, this is in different colors, of course, so it's not rainbow. I found, let me see if I can, uh, if I wrote down what, yeah, so this is the <laughs> Ditsy Daisy Granny Square. Um, I've done sunflowers. You saw sunflowers last time. This is Daisy and um, super simple. I love it. So this is a Ditsy Danny, da, dit Ditsy Daisy, I'm a Ditsy Daisy, Ditsy Daisy Granny Square by Lullaby Lodge. Um, I, I, I believe it's free. Yeah, it's a free uh, pattern. And I just, um, I ran out of the blue because I'd used the blue for the rain, you know, the other bags and everything. So I'd ran out of the blue. This is all just from, I think I had two, I had one skein of everything. I made four bags from one skein each. I got two of the white just to make sure that, or like the buff, just to make sure because there's a lot of white in those, but otherwise it was all, the, all one skein. So I still had some left over. So I made of, of the dark and the light. Um, I made the blue and then I was just going to do it all blue, but then I, I ran out of the dark blue. So I had to use a light blue. That's, ha that's what happened to my sunflower bag and I loved it. So I decided to just totally embrace it. <laughs> for this too. So this just needs straps, which means 
here's this is so cute so this has got like a little i don't know if you can see that but it's got like a little um washington sites the sites of washington state there you go um it's got that kind of lining this is where i had to worry about the right side right but i made this lining last i'd had some <laughs> practice i guess so this zipper is in the lining, the lining's in the bag. It is pinned to the bag, but I'm still thinking about straps for this one too. Like I'm thinking I want the straps, like two straps for them to come here. Um, but I haven't decided and what colors and like, what am I gonna do? So um, that's still a work in progress, mostly because it needs the strap and then I'll just sew the zipper in and we're done. Another one I'm probably gonna sell. So cute though, but it's really easy to make another one. Um, and who needs that many bags? As soon as I say it, I know I do, right? Okay. <laughs> um, let's see. My my sec my next work in progress. Next, next work in progress. Okay. So this is what is this called? Did I write this down? I don't think so. Um this is one of 13 squares I'm going to make. I've made, I'm working on number 11 right now, so I'm almost there. I wanted to make a market bag and I wanted to make a market bag that, so it's a market bag is usually just like a big kind of like scoop, you know, round sort of bag. Um, it's not necessarily lined, so you'll usually be able to just see the lace. It's just sort of meant to be kind of like open casual bag. Um, so I'd like to line it, but um, I might let myself not bother, <laughs> which would be handy. I'm kind of over the linings right now. Um, anyway, this is, I will put it here because I don't remember what it is. I'm just calling it sun square because it's got a sun in the middle and I love that. Um, so I wanted to make a kind of bag that is actually just three giant granny squares. Um, but I got all fussy about the giant patterns that I want. And I kind of tried to expand this one and I didn't like it. And I was just like, forget it. So I'm just going to do the small ones. This is, I'm totally going to say this wrong. I think I talked about this yarn before, even though I feel like it's the first time I've gotten this. So now I don't know what I'm talking about. This looks like sheepies to me. I know it. it's... It's pronounced a different way. I can't remember how it's pronounced anyway. So this is the yarn I'm using. Um, it's soft fun, probably totally pronouncing that all stupid in English. Um, it's the color, uh, soft mauve. This is a cotton and acrylic blend. Um, I gotta say, I don't care for it. Um, I mean, the fabrics or, or the, the color's nice. The fabric feels like weird and sort of like, cheap um what i wanted was kind of like a very like natural cottony vibe and this feels artificial it just feels yeah i can't explain it so i mean the yarn behaves fine it's a very round yarn um it's okay uh, I just kind of picked it up because it was like the fingering cotton that was there at my LYS and I needed it. But yeah, I, I just, I'm not a huge fan. So the good news is, is that this is, um, you know, kind of a, I mean, a cotton acrylic blend is pretty tough. You can kind of do whatever you need to it. So this can be a bag that somebody might like take to the beach, um, that can get, you know, wet and be washed and it's not a big deal. Uh, so again, I'm not going to worry about the lining, I think, cause it's just kind of made to like a, a, a tough bag that's still very beautiful. So I'm going to sew 13 of these together, make a handle. There you go. And then probably won't get any more of this yarn, um, ever just this particular one. I, I know, um, the brand is fantastic, but just this line of theirs, um, I guess I don't care for, but the pattern is pretty, um, I'd probably do this pattern again, although I'm kind of getting over it. <laughs> so, you know, you do a lot of granny squares or you do a lot of one thing and you're, you're ready to move on. Right. Okay. Speaking of ready to move on, I do think I have one more whip. Let me get it. And then we'll be ready for the big reveal. Um, so this is, so last time I showed you the Elwood sweater, right? Elwood. Yep. By Jenny Weeb. 
Um, I, th that sweater has, uh, it was a baby sweater and that sweater has been gifted and the recipient loved it and has had since, since had her baby. Um, so that's cool. And hopefully this winter, all those sweaters will fit them. Okay. So I, t I said that I was going to, um, think about making an Elwood for myself and I am. So, um, the thing about the Elwood is that it is a worsted weight, uh, which is fine. Um, but I want to, I wanted kind of more of a, a bulk and a hardiness, uh, to it. So, um, I decided I still want to use that pattern, but I am going to, uh, use a, a chunky yarn and try to make adjustments for the size and whatever. It's going to be, I think, a, f uh, a long, uh, cardigan, kind of like one that comes like way past my hips. Um, that's the plan anyway. Uh, and it's going to have a long ass button band, of course. Um, so let's see. Things are going well, I think. Um, I, it's top down. I am holding two strands together of a not inexpensive yarn. So it's kind of break in the bank, but that's just what happened. I started making this in the worsted, this gray uh, in the worsted, and I loved it, but I did not love the fabric. I needed a thicker fabric. So now I'm, um, because I'm in love with the yarn, I'm holding two strands together. So it's taking me twice as much and I'm going to make a, you know, way past my hips uh, cardigan. So it's going to be a lot. This is going to be a long-term project. So it's kind of hard to see because it's all rolled up and just crazy right now. But, um, I am almost ready to split for the sleeves. I need to, um, I think that I've got the width that I want, but I need to test it and, you know, like try it on and like see where it all ends up and kind of imagine how wide the button bands are going to be and see if that all lines up according to how I want it. I think I have the depth that I want, um, is the thing. So I need to see how wide it is according to the depth. Um, I need to figure all that out. So basically I'm getting to a point in the repeats where I'm almost finished with them anyway. And so I want to make sure that it's going to be what I want. So this, I've kind of stopped on this for, um, in the past week or so because I got the cotton crazies, right? <laughs> um, but this is uh blue sky fibers wool stock. It's a hundred percent wool. This gray, um, is cast iron. It's to die for. Um, I'm being kind of careful with like the lots and like I'm alternating skeins, like I'm holding two together from each lot and just, you know, just trying to make sure that I get it right this time. Um, because I'm hoping this will be kind of a staple because I do really love the fabric. Um, and the, just the feel it's very, it's very rustic feeling. Um, it's a non super wash. Yeah. It's a non super wash, hundred percent, um, Highland wool gorgeous. Uh, so definitely worth it. I am using uh, a 10, a size 10 uh, needle, I think, um, for that. And hopefully all goes well, but you'll probably see it again because I definitely am loving working on it. Um, just had to take a pause to figure everything out. I just wanted to show you how the skeins look. This is just like a big bottom chunk skein. I love it. So, um, this brand sells, uh, 150 gram skeins and then also 100 gram skeins and 50 gram skeins. Um, so my, my LYS in this color carried, um, the 150 gram skeins. And so it's just, you know, it's convenient if you know you're going to make a big project. You just, I don't know, you just have fewer skeins and it's, you make sure that the lot matches and all that. And it's just easier in that way. But I just love how gigantic this skein is. And it's just super gorgeous. It's showing up a little bit lighter on camera because it's so like bright in here. So you can see my mug, um, my face, not my mug. <laughs> Don't have a mug today. You know what I mean? Um, but I just love how rich and dark and, uh, you know, slightly heathered and just it's, ooh, sexy. This yarn is sexy. So I've got lots of that and I've, it's gotten different bags and I'm keep, keeping like lots separate. I kind of, I have two different lots and then I have a tiny bit from a third lot because it just was unavoidable. So I'm like keeping them all separate to make sure I, I remember that I use one of these and one of these and it's, it's crazy. Not that bad, but anyway. So that's kind of like my, one of my long-term projects, but that's going to get finished before, um, you know, my other blanket projects like the fire blanket or my, my death shroud. Um, <laughs> 
<laughs> see previous episodes for explanation about that. Okay, now I am so excited to show you a final product. This was a absolutely 100% uh, product knit, not a process knit. I will say I absolutely did not enjoy the process. I knew that would happen from the beginning. It is an absolutely no fault of the pattern. It is because I do not like making knit amigurumi. I find it very difficult. I usually make amigurumi and crochet, but you know what's coming, right? Okay, you ready for this? Here they are. Check it out. Frog and toad, completed, stuffed, dressed. I mean, so you've seen frog. I don't think you've seen him clothed. Oh, he needs a little, he's got, he already needs some repair. Look at that, his pants are falling down. I actually sewed his pants to him because I, uh, these aren't going to be, I want, I don't want them to be removable. And he's got a kind of a big chest and a, like skinny little hips. So his pants might want to fall down. So I sewed them to him, but they're kind of coming undone right there. So I <laughs> already need to repair that. Um, so, but I don't think you've seen him in his clothes. So here he is in his clothes. Doot. He's broad shouldered in the back there, I guess. Um, and then Toad came along. He's the one I most recently finished. Wearing his little swimsuit. <laughs> it's so funny. And one more time. Stick my face out of the way. Come on, guys, line up. There we go. So these guys, oh mama, what an undertaking. So I have been working on these guys since um, this, uh, well, earlier, last since last year. So like February, I think I would, had already was starting on them. Um, the pattern is 100% awesome. There's, there's so much tiny detail, especially, you know, the eyes and just, uh, uh, okay. So I don't want to discourage you from doing it. It's absolutely 100% worth it. I'm so glad I stuck with it. I'm never going to make them again. Some people might. I'll certainly know things better after, if I do make them again, right? So it's a great idea. Um, but for me, I knew I was going to make them once because they're awesome. And then I was going to keep them. I wasn't going to sell them or anything. And that would be that. So maybe someday, I'm telling you right now, probably not. Okay, so, yay! Let me tell you a little bit about the, um, the yarns and, uh, so let me actually erase. Let me tell you about the pattern in case you've been living under a rock and don't know about these guys. Um, this is the frog and toad pattern by frog and cast. Um, I, I think that it's present on Ravelry, but I think you have to go to her down, her, her website to download it, um, to purchase it. It is a paid for pattern. Um, the yarns I used, um, in general, I'll tell you, I used for the most part, um, uh, stolen stitches yarn, Nua, uh, and that is like for their bodies. And I'm not sure any of the clothes are Nua. I don't think they are. Um, I would have liked it that way. I just was really, really picky about the colors and I didn't find the right colors, but they're, I love Nua yarn. Um, it's a sport weight. It is so gorgeous. Um, it's got this gorgeous, like slight halo heathering. Um, the vibe of it is just excellent. I would make, I want to make so many things in there. I just don't often make sport weight stuff, I guess, but um, that is a yarn I'm going to keep my eye on for a long time. I've used it before I got to um, these guys, uh, but I think I frogged that project because I didn't like the pattern um, that I was trying to alter weirdly. Uh, so this is the first time I think I may have actually used it. i um, 100% happy with it. So absolutely recommend that yarn. But I'm going to go more detailed into the yarn and um, the colors and all my tips now. So if you want to know that, keep watching. If not, Hey, see you later. Thanks for stopping by. See you next time.
Okay, so I have a whole list of tips in ho and hopefully in um, relatively intelligent, uh, convenient order. So, you know, get your pencil out or I don't know, something. Um, so general tips that I want to give you just about the project um, overall. Uh, choose your yarns carefully and especially your colors, not only for frog and toad, but also for their clothing. That's primarily because... I think the colors are kind of half of what sells it. Yes, this is Toad, and we know Toad from um, the, you know, the the books, and obviously we would recognize them. But I think part of what sells things like this when you're trying to replicate something are all the details, and the colors are one of those details that I think can really matter. So choose the colors. You know, take some time to choose your colors that make sense to you. Um, the next tip is to use whatever yarn you choose, especially for the frog and toad bodies, um, use a yarn that is slightly fuzzy, also slightly heathery, especially slightly heathery, for a few reasons. Um, one, it makes it look more natural, so heathered or, you know, there's different tones in the color. Make sure that the color has a good depth so that it looks more natural and also so that it kind of looks, you know, more, I think like kind of like the old timey classic way that we would imagine like sort of old knitted special toys that have been well loved. Look, that's especially if you get it a little bit fuzzy, I think that makes sense. And they're also a little bit more cuddly. Sure. Um, the, the, another reason is that heathered or fuzzy yarn will hide mistakes better. I think especially heathered yarn will hide mistakes better. So, you know, like, my stitching isn't perfect. Uh, you know, if you look closely, you might be able to see, oh, there's a little bit of a knot or there's a little bit of a tension bubble or whatever. But first of all, don't stress about those mistakes too much. Really, I mean, here, unless I'm like looking at it, I'm pointing it out and stuff like that. You just, you look at him and you see Toad and that's exactly what you see. You don't see, wow, what, ew, what's that, right? So don't stress about the mistakes, but any that you do make can be nicely hidden again with a, a more textured and heathered colored yarn. Now, um, tips as you actually are knitting and creating, especially about the eyes I want to talk about. So first of all, if you know how to crochet, crochet the eyes. I think crocheting um, tiny little circles is so much easier to do in crochet than knit. You know, if you don't, it might be worth learning. Um, I used a technique called the magic circle, and some people find that difficult. Um, there are tons of tutorials, I think, that you can master it, but if you've never crocheted before, you don't even know how to make a chain, maybe it's not worth it for you. Um, but I would say if you if you can crochet even a little bit, um, using the magic circle technique for the eyes, I think is just much easier than, than knitting a tiny circumference. Um, and of course they are tiny. There's like four or six stitches in there. I can't remember, but they're tiny. Um, also make, make all four eyes at once. You know, um, you'll go through the pattern once to make frog, then you'll go through it again to make toad. Um, but it, you know, you might want to just make all the eyes when you get to them, right? It's just kind of handy. Uh, very important always leave long tails whenever you're knitting. Um, so you'll, you'll stop and start a lot. You'll, you'll cut your yarn and join your yarn a fair amount in each doll. Um, because you'll like, you'll join for, you'll, you'll join and start knitting for the arms. Um, it is, uh, done top down, but you start with the provisional cast on and then you'll done, you'll go in the round, but then you'll split for the, the legs. Um, you, I think you have to rejoin for the knees so and the eyes and stuff. So you'll have a, a fair amount of stops and starts. Um, that's part of the pattern to get the shaping the way that you want it. So leave long tails whenever you can. I'd say a good 9 to 12 inches. I know that that uses up a little bit more yarn, especially if you're doing it a lot. And I know that that tail management can be frustrating. Don't hide them as you go. Um, keep them out and use them at the end. The reason is, is that you will have, you will likely have a number of, um, holes in your knitting as you go, like purposefully, um, or not purposefully, but just like, it's kind of just the nature. So when you stop and start a yarn, maybe you'll have a little bit of a gap. Um, you'll, uh, you'll definitely have a gap because when you, uh, knit the tubes for the arms and the legs, they're open tubes. And then you knit flat to do the hands and the feet. Um, so there's all these join points, um, where there'll be a tube that you'll have to close up. 
You'll also just have holes just with knitting that wouldn't be a big, big deal, but the stuffing can come out, um, especially because you'll be using pellets. I'll get to that in a minute. Um, so the stuffing can come out through holes. So you'll, you'll find holes that might not have mattered that are just a tiny little gap between stitches um, that aren't even really like a hole, not like a yarn over or anything or a mistake, just, you know, a little bit of a gap between the stitches. And you'll want that uh, a yarn handy to close that up. So all of your tails will already be attached. There'll al already be a strength there that you can use to sew everything up. And you don't need to hide any tails anyway, because you can stuff them all on the inside when you're done. So I definitely recommend long tails, especially around the eyes, but really everywhere. Um, during knitting, I would recommend, it might not be a big deal, but when you knit, um, you come to a point where the, where the kind of like the broadest part of the face is. Let me kind of see if I can pull it out. You see how he kind of goes out and then down. So this broadest part of the face is about where the mouth should land. I actually ended up putting two uh, clippy stitch markers where that ended just so that when I put the mouth in, I knew you know, where I wanted to land on both sides. Um, Toad actually still ended up a little bit crooked. Crooked. It's fine. It's adorable. Um, but I kind of did that with, with uh, Frog too. So just, you know, I put clippy markers here as I was knitting so that I knew exactly where they were um, and then didn't have to come back and find them later. I knew exactly where that mouth wanted to go across, which is the, you know, kind of like this broadest part of this angle. You can see it kind of comes, it angles out and that's in the pattern. They show you how to do that. But of course you embroider the mouth later. So um, if you mark those two edges, you'll know exactly where to embroider the mouth. Um, while we're talking about the mouth, let me show you how I did the mouth, which was basically I used embroidery floss, um, two or three strands. I wouldn't use a full thickness of yarn. I'd use something thinner than what you, you knit them out of, um, which I think just kind of looks better. Just a basic black. You could use maybe like a soft gray or whatever you, however you want it to look, whatever color you want it to look. Um, but then I kind of make sure I hold him in focus so he's not driving you crazy. Then I actually took, I came from the inside. I did the mouth before he was all sewn up so that I could come from the inside and stick my tails in and everything. That's not necessary, but it's, it can be handy. And then I, with some loose tension, not crazy loose, but loose tension, I went all the way around, just one long strand. I came in through here or up through here and back down through there. And then in order to make sure the mouth shape stays this curve, I kind of pushed it up to just have it sit on that curve. And then I did a small, small little tack there. So I came up and down to just capture that yarn so it will stay there. And then I just tucked the, you know, knotted it and tucked the tails on the inside. And there you go. Okay, let's talk about eyes. Eyes. There's Frog's eyes. They're a little wonky. <laughs> There's Toad's eyes. Could be a little wonky too. I don't know. Um, the eyes are probably the most difficult part. You know, let's be honest, they're tiny, they're little round guys. Um, so a several tips there. First of all, um, in the pattern, you do a, a small little cut. So I actually made that one little cut, tiny cut with a seam ripper. Um, and I found that gave me a level of precision that, that gave me the feel goods. <laughs> um, also really take your time when unpicking the stitches, um, to, so you'll, you'll, you'll cut one stitch so that you can just unravel a tiny little bit, um, for the top and bottom of the eye. And then you'll put your DPNs, uh, in there. You'll pick up those stitches back up again so you can start knitting there. So I just recommend taking your time when picking up those stitches. And actually what I did was got one of those little clippy markers and every stitch that I carefully, carefully and slowly unraveled, um, I caught with that clipping marker to make sure that I didn't lose where I was at or lose that stitch or that things didn't start unraveling because it can feel kind of nerve wracking. So if you capture every stitch as you go, you'll feel a lot more secure and that you can, you know, then put them all on your needle after you've unraveled what you need to unravel. So when you unravel the eye stitches, you will pull the, you know, some, you'll have some thread that you'll pull out, but it's going to be like this much. <laughs> so it's not, 
it, it's, it can be kind of nerve wracking feeling like now you need to secure those stitches so it doesn't under unravel further and secure those ends that you cut because you cut your knitting, right? So you have to secure that somehow. And you can do that like you could maybe knot those little tiny ends together like behind the eye or something. Um, but while you're working on it, that can actually, I think, interfere. So honestly, what I did was I took a little bit of scotch tape and I taped those ends to each other and then I folded the tape over so that they were captured. Um, and that was very helpful to make sure that they didn't um, unravel further or get away or move at all. Um, even better than a knot, which can come unraveled and things like that when you're rustling with it. And then you can pull the tape off and knot them later after the eye is all done. And it's not going to interfere with you that that knot. But I didn't, I left the tape in there and just stuffed it on the inside. <laughs> so um, that's a tip for the eyes. Um, when sewing the eyes in, make sure that they're both facing upright, like, like the direction you want. There is a direction to the eyes. Um, the pupils have a little bit of a T shape and you can see, I even struggled with trying to, even though I recognize where they should go, I had a little bit of trouble <laughs> in trying to get those T shapes, you know, matched up. So they're a little bit different. It gives them character and that's fine. Okay. Before you stuff them and finish them. I am not kidding. Set up a really good area. Don't like if you're anything like me, I just knit in the corner of my couch, you know, and I put stuff on my table next to me and I have a little craft light, but really make sure you have room to spread out. I would sit at a table um, that you have all your supplies with you. Good light, seriously, because it's it's a little bit frustrating to work this small and a little bit nerve wracking to cut your knitting and to try and knit in a small area and keep track of your your little tiny tails and all that. Right. So just set yourself up. You know, this is me telling you to make a swatch. The equivalent of making a swatch, right, is set yourself up to knit well. But, but seriously, do. Um, so good light and all that. But here's the supplies I would recommend. So a sharp yarn needle and a tapestry needle. Uh, a sharp yarn needle, meaning the eye is big enough to fit some yarn in. Because sometimes um, you may not want to just go stitch for stitch. You might need a, a sharp needle to actually um, maneuver the yarn where you want to go when you're sewing. So I would have either just in case at least three DPNs because you are going to need to knit again. Um, even though it seems like the everything's done and you've done the eyes and everything, you actually have to knit flaps in order for the eyes to fit in. So you'll need three DPNs. You'll also, um, I, I absolutely would not do this on anything other than DPNs, by the way. Um, I know some people want magic loop when they want like a small circular. It's just too small to do anything, but you're really just going to have to do it. I would recommend that for the body too. That's up to you, um, but definitely when you get into these tiny little guys, the eyes and the, the hands and or the the, the um, arms and stuff, really just DPNs, just do it. Okay, so um, several clip markers, the actual clip markers. Um, I didn't really use a stitch marker very often to just kind of keep track of the rounds. Um, you know, you can, but um, that's really only going to be meaningful, like maybe for like the basic body, right? Um, have uh, a seam ripper or um, a small, a, a small sharp pair of scissors. Big old sewing scissors are a little bit hard to make sure you're getting to clip that one little eye stitch. Um, so make sure you have the right uh, tool for cutting. Um, have a little crochet hook if you can to make sure that you can catch any drop stitches. Um, because when you're, especially when you're doing the eyes or when you're sewing up anything, um, you know, around the eyes, you want to make sure that you don't drop more stitches than you're supposed to. So, um, and it's all very fiddly. So having a crochet hook that's about the, the same size as, you know, your yarn, something small enough, but not too small, um, will help you in recovering any drop stitches. Um, also tape, as I said, if you want to do that eye trick, um, like scotch tape, you know, sticky tape. And, uh, I would say pellets and stuffing. Okay, so let's talk about pellets. Use pellets <laughs> instead of stuffing. That's the conversation. Um, because the, so the pellets, I don't know if you can, can you hear this? I'm squishing that noise. Those are the pellets in there. And um, the you can get them at a craft store just like you can stuffing. Um, and I, it's basically like if you were wanting to make a bean bag. I 100% recommend the pellets. They feel so much better. I don't know what it is, but it feels good in your hands. Um, the weight 
of the pellets in there, um, the shaping, it's, it's worth it. So I would absolutely recommend using pellets instead of stuffing, unless you just can't stand it. And then, you know, that's fair. Do what you got to do. Right. Um, but I definitely recommend the pellets. However, I will say that I used a little bit of stuffing at the top of each of their head because, um, when you're filling with the pellets, you know, they'll, they'll settle in. I'm going to give you more tips about the pellets, but they'll settle into all the little areas, but you're, you're going to be filling the, the guy. So he's going to be open right here. And that's the opening you're filling in. You can't fill him so full that he falls apart, that he, like he spills his pellets every time you even move him because you're going to have to sew that up. Um, but you want him full enough, right? So, so I put a tiny bit of stuffing, actual like polyfill stuffing in the top of the head for two reasons. One, it makes it easier to stuff in there and nothing will fall out while you're maneuvering him to sew. And two, um, it's easier to fill that space so that his head isn't all sunken in. Um, because you're going to want to like, you know, kind of like get some stuffing behind the eyes and get some stuffing in the face. Um, and he'll kind of sink if you can't get the pellets high enough. So the stuffing kind of closes up that gap and then also keeps more pellets from falling out while you're sewing him up. So definitely recommend that. Absolutely use a container, some kind of Tupperware container or bowl or whatever that's, you know, decently large um, when you're filling them and when you're sewing them um, because pellets will fall out. They just will. Um, so have a container so that you catch all those stray pellets um, and can put them in, back in the bag, you know, when you're done. Um, and I can't tell you how many times I wanted to just turn them a little bit to see something and pellets fall out. You know, it just, it will happen. I actually thought a funnel might be useful, um, but you you need a really wide bottom because the, the pellets will bottleneck super easy. So I ended up not using the funnel that I thought would be fine. So <laughs> you can try that if you have something really wide, but just a thought. Um, you will want a, I didn't even put this in the supply list. Shoot. You will want a chopstick or a pencil or something to be able to, um, aid you in stuffing, even though it's not, um, you know, polyfill, it's pellets. Um, you will want that because, uh, so first of all, take the pencil or the chopstick or whatever, um, for your empty frog or toad and actually jam it down all the limbs just to kind of pre-open those. And then um, as you fill, that will make them more inclined to go into the, those limbs, but you'll still have to work it. It, it, doesn't, um, it doesn't necessarily fill this up. So um, you will have to take, you know, you'll have to fill it up and it'll fill all the way up to the top. And you'll have to take that chopstick or that pencil and kind of jam it down into the limbs and encourage the pellets to fall in all those limbs. And you'll need to do that a few times, um, you know, kind of wait for the pellets to settle, um, jostle it around a little bit and then, you know, jam it into those holes, um, especially like, you know, look kind of lower down here, make sure it all gets in there first so that as you fill it up, you can get the right bulk up here without it just eventually drifting into the limbs that were too empty to begin with. So make sure you do that. Um, as I said, you'll probably have holes. Um, that's why you will need those, all those tails. So you'll always have a tail handy nearby to sew up any holes. Now, these are not mistake holes. These are just necessarily, these are just the nature of the project holes. Um, uh, one you might get a lot is like around the knees or something like that. So when you fill in the pellets, um, again, you'll have your container to catch any pellets that come through. That's not just from any like overflow. That can also be, um, you know, as you're stuffing, when uh, if there is a hole big enough for a pellet to fit through, you'll find it. So that's actually a really helpful way to see those. And you'll be more likely to see them um, that way than maybe just inspection. So I, I recommend do both. Um, but when you're filling them, if you see like a little pellet kind of leaking out somewhere, you'll know that's where you have to fill. Unless it's gushing, you know, you can wait till you're kind of generally all filled and then, and um, you know, sewn up before you sew up those little holes. Um, but if it's, if it's really bad, you might need to kind of stop and do it then. None of mine were really bad to have to do that. So you're probably, you know, you'll probably be fine. Okay, so finishing. Um, a couple items about finishing. And by finishing, I just mean like the overall look, you know, dressing in them in their clothes and whatever. Um, the first thing is blocking. Um, in my opinion, you don't need to block a uh, frog. He'll be stuffed 
And so that will kind of fill him out, or frog or toad. So um, that'll fill him out. There's no need for that. But you will want to block the hands and the feet um, to get them to lay flat. So you can wait till he's completely finished to block him. Because I actually just like kind of sprayed, um, just with a spray bottle, hands and feet, and just like pinned those. Um, so he can just lay there while you while you do that. Uh, so definitely block the fingers and toes, but don't you don't need to worry. Um, you can finish him almost entirely before you do that at the end. Now, um, when you sew up the uh, top here, you'll have, a, if you decided to do a provisional cast on, um, you'll need to pull that out in order to pick up those stitches. Um, take your time doing that. Um, and, you know, as a lover of provisional cast ons, I really like it when you can kind of take your needle and like, you know, pick up five or six of those stitches and just like whoop, unzip, right? It's just, it's too fiddly to do that, unfortunately. Um, you know, the, the yarn I used maybe might have been a little bit sticky, but honestly, I think really it was just that it's so small. My DPNs aren't that sharp, so a sharper needle might, you know, help. But I actually, just because it's so small, and again, because you can't wrestle him because his pellets will fall out while you're doing that, even with the, the uh, stuffing up there, you know, it can still be tricky. So you don't want to like, you know, get, try and get in there, right? Um, so what I actually had to do was like, pull out a stitch entirely and then grab it with a needle before I put it onto my DPN. Um, maybe you won't have that trouble, but just again, take your time with that um, and make sure you don't drop, uh, you know, any stitches and look carefully, you know, when you're finished before you, you call it good. Right. Um, and when you're sewing, uh, hold him gently, <laughs> right? Remember to hold him gently because those pellets will move. Right. And so if you're like squeezing him tight so that you can get a good grip, you'll pop the pellets out. Right. So just hold them gently while you sew. And um, the final tip is just consider whether or not you want to sew their clothing on. Um, I would just say that for me, I did want to sew the clothing on so that it will stay in place um, uh, in the way that I want, because these aren't going to be toys to play with. If you're making them for kids, I <laughs> I know that kids like to, you know, dress the dolls and stuff like that. So maybe you want to make more clothes or maybe you want to make them removable so they can try on each other's clothes or whatever. Um, so that's fine. You know, you don't need to sew them on. But otherwise, I would recommend sewing them on if they're just meant to be a display piece, because then they'll just lay how you want. Um, I like I haven't sewn the jacket on, for example, and you can kind of see it's like it doesn't sit straight. It kind of like angles. Let me show you that. So when I just hold him, you know, I've, I've kind of straightened that out. But if I'm just like kind of picking him up and there he is, you know, it kind of does that. Right. And then also I need to sew up the pants so that they don't droop off his body. So I think it can be worth sewing on if you want them to look just so, but consider what you're going to be doing with them. I think that is all my tips. So there is Frog and Toad, finally finished. I am just over the moon with how they turned out and over the moon that they're done. I I told you all that it would take a long time and that I wasn't going to be thrilled about it, but I was going to be thrilled about the result and completely true. Do recommend the pattern if you're willing to, um, you know, go through it in order to get the finished product. But uh, I certainly was. It took me over a year, but it's the result is fantastic. One more look. So I think that's all I have to show you. If you made it to the end, congrats. Um, I see that we're having our little window of sun outside. So I think I'm going to wrap this up and go outside and get some sunshine. Maybe do a little bit of knitting out there. Um, so thanks for watching. See you next time. Bye.